I invite you to rise, whether in body or just in spirit, as we call ourselves to worship. Beloved, God calls us to Sabbath, to rest and recharge, to pause and pay attention. God calls us to worship, to praise and pray, to give thanks and sing. God calls us to listen, to hear God's word, to learn and grow. God calls us to repent, to be honest and humble, to trust in grace. God calls us to a feast, to eat and remember, to celebrate with joy. God calls all of us and all that we are. Come, let us bring our hearts and minds, our hands and feet, our visions and voices, and worship the Lord. Despite all the ways that we speak of sin, failures, or mistakes, intended acts, Scripture tells us that we are stubborn-hearted, wanting only our own way. But if we pause to listen to God, if, if we open our mouths and our hearts to confess our sin, God will fill our emptiness with forgiveness and with hope. So let us pray together as we say, we are always uncomfortable watching God. When you notice how we want to sit in the seats of honor, we can feel so proud so good, so right, that it is easy to imagine we are superior to others. When someone suggests that maybe we're not seeing the whole picture, maybe our perspective is not the only one, maybe we're not as good and as right as we think, we go into fight or flight mode to either deny our accuser or to attack them. Forgive us when we cast blame and shame on others and forgive us all knowing God when we deny and attack you. Forgive our unwillingness to listen to you when you tell us we have sinned. Forgive our hesitance to trust the grace and forgiveness you offer us Forgive our reluctance to humble ourselves so that you might lift us up. Have mercy on us, O oh God, and send your spirit to help us trust it, that on the grounds of your grace we might take root and grow. Shape us and transform us by your forgiveness. This we lift in love and ask. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the good news. After what God has done for us, what can anyone or anything do to us? We are new people, graced by our living God. Forgiven, embraced, welcomed by our God. We will offer open hearts and serving hands to everyone we meet. Thanks be to God. Amen. This morning's scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 14th chapter, verses 7 through 11. Jesus is at a dinner party invited by the Pharisees and has just healed a man on the Sabbath. And in the midst of the confusion as to how to exactly respond to that, this 
next scene it takes place. And when Jesus noticed how all the guests sought out the best seats at the table, he told them a parable. When someone invites you to a wedding celebration, don't take your seat in the place of honor. Someone more highly regarded than you could have been invited by your host. The host who invited both of you will come and say to you, please give your seat to this other person. Embarrassed, you will take your seat in the least important place. See, instead, when you receive an invitation, go and sit in the least important place. And when your host approaches you, he will say, friend, move up here to a better seat. Then you will be honored in the presence of all of your fellow guests. All who lift themselves up will be brought low, but those who make themselves low will be lifted up. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I'm human, in case you didn't notice. And I got sucked down a YouTube rabbit hole this past week. Um, I, was, I was watching woodworkers who were, who were designing and, and building these tables based on the principles of tensegrity or tensile integrity. Right, the first video caught my eye because a tensegrity table looks like no other table I've ever seen before, and, and I just encourage you to go home and search it on the internet, because I'm going to try and describe to you what this is, but it's, it's, not, it's not going to make sense, probably. See, the, a basic tensegrity table consists of two separate pieces, right? There's the base, and there's the top of the table, but the top of the table um, is not supported by the base, as, as we regularly might understand a table, but it's like, if this were the top of the table and this is the base, the top is like hanging from the base somehow, so it looks like the top of the table is floating, defying the laws of gravity, and then the corners are held in tension by other cables going down to keep it from tipping over. So it's this very specific way you have to balance it out, otherwise it just doesn't work. So it looks like this floating table that, that shouldn't be possible. So I had to keep watching these videos until I understood exactly how such a table was built. Jesus' parable tells of another table that looks like nothing we've ever seen before. It's, it's a table where Pharisees don't squabble over who gets the best seat. Jesus tells of a table where those who humble themselves and sit low will be lifted up to a better seat, and those who exalt themselves will be humiliated. I guess he's more describing a social structure here than an actual table. But still, this is not how we're used to seeing social structures work. We're more used to an attitude of, if you're not first, you're last, or, or a yurtle the turtle style of social ascendancy, whereby you move up the social ladder on the backs of others. Now, to be fair, that story ends with a very humiliating fall from grace. But then we see Jesus actually doing it, actually eating with Pharisees and tax collectors and sinners, healing the sick, whether they be Jews or Gentiles or, or servants of a Roman centurion. We see him hanging from the cross in death and lifted to a life greater than that which any of us could have ever fathomed without him showing us the way such a life shouldn't be possible. And I had to keep reading scripture until I understood exactly how such a life was built. See, fortunately for us, just like woodworking videos on YouTube, there are many carpenters' parables in the Gospels. And what sets a parable apart from the other lessons is this phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like... Now, it's either explicitly mentioned at the beginning of the parable, or it is implicit in the lesson. So another way to look at parables, then, would be as instructions for how to build this seemingly impossible social structure in which God calls us to live. Instructions for living a new life. The lesson in this particular parable from Luke is about humility 
Those who lift themselves up will be brought low, and those who make themselves low will be lifted up. But just like the table, there's a very specific way in which to do this, otherwise it just doesn't work out. Fred Craddock warns against the possible farce which could be created by understanding humility as simply another means of getting ahead. Right? Imagine, if you would, two southern gentlemen stuck in limbo at a doorway, refusing to allow the other to hold the door for them. No, sir, I insist after you. No, 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 please. Just so, Craddock chuckles at the scene in which all the dinner guests rush to the lowest seat like five-year-olds in a game of musical chairs, knowing that the host will surely call them up to a better spot. Such perverted humility hardly follows the instructions Jesus is setting forth in this lesson. It just relocates the same squabble to the other end of the table. I mentioned, I think it was two weeks back, my last online sermon, how humility is the only place from which we are able to look up and truly see grace for what it is. True humility is the goal of confession, a practice to which we are invited with the foreknowledge of grace. But does such foreknowledge impact the integrity of our confession? If, if we confess only because we already know we'll be forgiven, are we truly humbling ourselves? Are we confessing from a place of repentance whereby grace can actually transform us? Well, in order to answer that question or, or touch on it, I, I went down another rabbit hole, and I promise this is the last one, and I blame this on my parents who couldn't finish a meal at the dinner table without going to grab some sort of etymological book to look up the, the basis of words. So, so I have that same nerd driven into me. I did a, I did a word study on, on the root of the word humility. And it comes from the Latin word humilis. See, I, see, I was wondering if humility and humanity and humiliation and humor might somehow all be connected. So the Latin word humilis means lowly or low, but it also means, get this, earth or soil. So my mind goes straight to Genesis in which humanity is created out of humilis. There's something about humility that is integral to our nature as human beings which is the very thing we abandoned by trying to take that which was not belonging to us in the first place, equivalence to God. You don't need to listen to God's instructions, the tempter whispers. You just take what you want, become great, control your own destiny. The table of grace is a tensegrity table of sorts, built by a master carpenter and sin throws it out of balance. See, our invitation to this table is embedded in Christ's lessons about humility. Within the balance of God's kingdom, true humility is not about beating ourselves up. It's, it's not about self-deprecation. It's not about guilt and shame. True humility is about letting God be God and letting ourselves be who God created us to be. Humilis, you are soil in the hands of God. May you be lifted up in this truth to a better seat. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and God will lift you up higher and higher, and God will lift you up. Amen. All right. Let us join in singing our hymn of response. <clears throat> oh.
Which one is that? It's on this page. Near the cross. Let us continue in unison using the words of the Apostles' Creed to profess what we believe. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, let us, let us sing as we prepare our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our, our humilis, the very grounds of, of what we are, to be lifted by God's grace 
at this wonderful feast. Come to the table of grace, my friends. Jesus took bread and broke it and said, this is my body. When he took wine and poured it out and said, this is my blood. And then he invited his disciples to take, eat, take and drink. It was an invitation, the likes of which they had never received before. And I'm sure that in that moment, they didn't quite understand how it worked. I'm sure when they tried to battle off the guards that came to arrest him in the garden that night, they didn't understand how it worked. When they saw him breathe his last breath on the cross, they didn't understand how it worked. When they thought his body had been robbed from the grave, they didn't understand how it worked. It's hard to understand exactly how much God loves us. This feast is a glimpse, a, a foretaste of the kingdom of God about which Jesus teaches and instructs. It's hard to understand exactly how it works. But here's, here's what I do know. Come exactly as you are. Because God is ready to meet you here. Don't judge yourself. Don't judge those who God invites to dine beside you. Just come as you are. And I promise your encounter with grace will be transforming life giving. So all of you who hunger and thirst, even if you don't understand how it works, come and be fed and be lifted up. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Indeed, holy and merciful God, full of grace, full of power, full of love that is beyond our comprehension. 
it is right and good to give you thanks and praise. Recognizing that in the lifting of our hearts, we are held by your spirit. The same spirit which at the beginning of all things brought life and light out of chaos and darkness. You continue to fill our lives in those places of confusion, those places of darkness, those places of brokenness with the ongoing gifts of repentance, of reformation, of lifting. You have modeled this time and again throughout the history of humanity's fallenness and the examples of your faithfulness and graciousness to us. In the fullness of time, you, you called your own son to embody for us at a table of grace a symbol of what your love for us means, a brokenness that heals, a pouring out that fills us up, a dying that gives us life. We thank you for Jesus who is our Savior and for those saving acts of great grace. May we find in this bread and in this cup that we share this day full communion in those by the power of your spirit that we ask you to send down upon us to connect us with tensile integrity and the balance of your great kingdom. Hold us fast in your grace, lift us up, open our eyes and our ears to see and hear your calling on our lives more clearly. That as we go forth fed in this feast, we also go forth glowing in the light of your glory, shining and inviting others into this space of grace and compassion and healing we have found in you. Bless this meal in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night of his arrest, very, very similar to this, Jesus took bread. And I think it's kind of like a, uh, a pill here. You peel off the back piece of aluminum foil to receive your wafer. Yeah, right in there. And he told them, this represents my body which is broken for you. Take, eat, and know that you are loved. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup represents a new covenant that is sealed in my blood. Take and drink, all of you, in remembrance of me. Friends, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we witness to and proclaim the saving death of our Lord Jesus until he comes again. Let us pray. For the bread which you have broken, for the wine which you have poured, for the love which you now show us, we give you thanks, O Lord. We give you thanks for the lessons of Scripture. We give you thanks for the model of Christ. We give you thanks for the witness 
of our brothers and sisters seated beside us and gathered in that great cloud of witnesses. We give you thanks for many things, O oh God. On this weekend especially, we give you thanks for a country in which our freedom includes the ability to gather and worship outside on a beautiful day. To pursue and study and follow and practice your words and wisdom in our daily life freely, without persecution. To be able to share your love in new and inspiring ways. We give thanks for this country, O oh God, and ask that you continue to call us and shape us through practices of humility until we are more and more like the kingdom to which you call the entire world to live. Bless all of us gathered here this day to be your hands and feet in that kingdom as we go forth fed, ready to build, ready to love, ready to serve. As we ask in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God, a part of the balance we find in you is between the joy of, of knowing and trusting your grace and the sorrow of living in a world where, where sickness and death and hurting and struggle and arguing are still present. We celebrate those things which are good and ask for your mercy and guidance in those things that are difficult, trusting that you are with us no matter what. Keep us held in the balance, O oh God, mindful of what is beautiful, the bounty of the earth, whether it's string beans or a double baptism. There are beautiful things to celebrate. We seek to do that and give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn of sending is, O oh Christ, surround me.
Remember that you are soil, and to soil you will return. But also, remember what unfathomable things God was able to do with soil and a little breath and a little grace. We are miraculous, miraculous beings held in this balance, kept afloat by the Spirit. May you trust the miracle that is you, the love that is God's for you, the grace poured out by our Lord Jesus Christ, and the beautiful balancing of the Holy Spirit between us. And the blessing of the Holy Trinity. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve one another. Shalom.